I am thankful that you are right now watching this and you are with me in a Bible study, a very brief Bible study about something that I think is extremely important. When I was asked to do this, I, it was suggested that I might focus on some things that would be helpful for relationships, particularly family relationships. And I am eager to do that because you see, for the last 45 years, that's been the focus of my life is what does it take to build positive, healthy, meaningful, lasting relationships? I say 45 years because I began this search, this journey when I was about 16 years old. I know some of you are wondering who on earth is this person talking to us right now? And others of you remember when I visited the Philippines, we had such a good time together. And I, I don't know that I adequately express to you how thankful I am. I mean, really, for every memory I have of our time together. I mean, I was so impressed with your love, your devotion, your dedication to God. You encouraged me. I came there to the Philippines. I went to the Philippines with the intention to encourage you. And I was encouraged by you because of your faith and your devotion and your love and your deep sense of contentment in your relationship with God. At least that's how I perceived your walk with the Lord is. Now I know that's not true for everyone, and I know that's not true all the time, but it is the center attitude of your heart. I could tell that during the brief time that we had together. I am hoping that God will bring us back together again. Others of you are watching, and we've had previous uh, interaction before, We've got a relationship going, and I'm so glad that you're involved in this Bible study as well. And some of you are just tuned in. You wonder who in this? Well, I'm Kevin Skidmore. I grew up in West Virginia, went to school in New Mexico, where I got a master's degree in communication and halfway through a master's degree in Bible. Went to University of Cincinnati to work as a campus minister, ended up preaching, was preaching in Port Huron, Michigan, came to Columbia, Missouri, in the middle of the country, and then Logan, Utah, and then back to Springfield, Missouri. Yes, I spent nine years in the state of misery and constant confusion. <laughs> and for those of you who didn't pick up on that nuance, I lived in the state of Missouri, but I call it the state of misery because it is so hot and humid. Now, I know I'm speaking to a bunch of folks from the Philippines, and you understand hot and humid. <laughs> And then we moved to Logan, Utah, like I said, back to Springfield, Missouri, and then up to Boise, Idaho. Boise, Idaho is actually the longest that I've lived anywhere in one place in my life. And it was there that I met two important people in the world, especially in your world, those of you who are Filipino, Alvin and Fay Luther. And I wanna to say to you, Alvin and Faye, if you're watching right now, I wanna tell you, I am so thankful for you. I'm thankful for your love for each other. I'm thankful for your love for the Lord. I'm thankful for the example that you've set for over 50 years, both of your marriage to each other and your mission work there in Bacallad and your work with the Shiloh Christian High School or the Christian School. Thank you for the work that you've done and for the encouragement you give and for the steadiness of your walk with the Lord. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your open devotion to the people of God and your, your dedication to bring the good news to the Philippine Islands and to the, those who live in that area that in your Jerusalem, in your Samaria, in Judea, in the other most parts of the world, you are so influential in the kingdom of God. Thank you for your work and your dedication. I hope one day soon we'll have some time to spend together again. Now, right now I'm living in Centerton, Arkansas, which is right next to Bentonville, Arkansas, which may not mean anything to anyone. Bentonville, Arkansas is about 40 minutes north of Fayetteville. Fayetteville is where the University of Arkansas is, the Razorbacks. And uh, I moved here because 
of my family. Now, some of you know and some of you don't. Now, let me just begin this way, all right? I've had three or four major events in my life that have made me realize God designed us for relationships. First of all, relationship with Him, and then secondly, with each other. And that comes out of the relationship. Now, you're going to find this kind of funny, but the relationship that we have internally with ourselves. Now, first of all, I'm building this off of the expression that Jesus gave, the statement, the command, the encouragement, the challenge that Jesus gave. When he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second commandment is just like the first. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Now, if I read that correctly, and I think I am, Jesus is saying, for you to be a healthy, functioning human being in this planet, to live life to its fullest, to have the greatest satisfaction in life, God needs to be center. He needs to be number one. You need a growing, healthy, dynamic relationship with God, a lasting relationship with God, where you love Him supremely. The word there is agape in Greek, which means a sacrificial, all-encompassing, giving love. The other is number one, a love that you would give your life for the other one. So you're to love God with that kind of love, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. In other words, all of your emotions need to be emotions. Whatever emotion you're experiencing, it should be emotion that you can love God out of. And if you're experiencing emotion that you cannot legitimately love God with that emotion, then you need to change the emotion. You say, how do I change my emotion? Part two, love the Lord your God with all your soul. That's who you are, your personality. And so you love God out of the, the objective you, the core of who you are. You say, well, I can't change that. It's just, I, I am who I am. No, you can change that. In fact, you changed that when you became a Christian. Didn't you? Didn't you? Doesn't the Bible still say if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All of the old is gone. Everything has become new. Yes, you can change. And that's the positive good news. I'm here to bring you good news. And the good news is you can change at the very core of who you are. Now that's exciting to me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, your personality, your the, the word there in the Greek is psyche, psyche, which psyche, we get the word psychology from that, the study of the soul, personality. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. You're thinking things through. If there are thoughts that I'm having that I can't love God while I hold on to those thoughts, I need to get rid of those thoughts. You say, no, that's easier because I can change the way I think. Okay. Let me erase that for you. Erase that, would you? It's not easy to change your thought patterns, but it is necessary. That's what the word repent means. And you started to come in your relationship with God in repentance. That is, you've changed your mind. God is God and you're not. You have relationship with him. He who created you wants you. And he wants you in relationship with himself. So you love your God, Lord your God with all your thoughts, your way you think things through. Doi, uh, metanoia, the, the, the diagnoia, was where you think things through rather. Okay, so how you make your decisions, how you perceive life, those are the things that control your personality and your emotions. The greatest impact on how you feel is how you think. And then finally, how you act. How you act also impacts how you feel, who you are, how you think. It's how you choose to act. 
and love the Lord your God with all your strength. Now, the word strength there is not actually action. It's the ability to do the action. So you're loving God out of your ability to perform, your ability to act, your choices in life. Life is made up of decisions. Choose wisely. I remember I had a t-shirt that said that once. Life is full of decisions. Choose wisely. I love that message. I think it's powerful. And, and I want you to realize that these four areas that Jesus said we are to love the Lord our God out of, the source of our love is out of our heart, our emotions, our affections, our commitments, our values, our heart, our soul. That is who we are in the very core, our personality, who you say you are. I am. First of all, I am Christian. I am related to God. That's core of my personality, my identity. Love the Lord your God out of all your mind and out of all your strength, your ability to perform, your actions. And they all work on each other. I behave because I feel, and I feel because I behave. Now, I believe that all things actually generate out of the mind. And I need to love the Lord God in the core of my thinking. It's going to directly affect how I feel, who I am, and how I behave. But how I behave affects how I feel and what I think and who I am. And who I am affects what I think and how I feel and how I behave. And how I feel affects who I am, how I think, and how I behave. They all work together. Don't separate them and work on only one thing. Just realize when you're working on one, it's going to affect all of the others. So let's start with the mind and the decision. And the second commandment is like that. Love the Lord your God with all, uh, <laughs> that was the first. The second one is like, just like the first one. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Love your neighbor like you, what? Love yourself? I thought Christian faith was you don't love you. You love others, but you don't love you. No, that's not the heart of the Christian message. The heart of the Christian message really is that you would love yourself, but it's coming out of your healthy love for God. Then you can honestly have a healthy love, respect, honor, value for yourself, a commitment to yourself. There's nothing wrong with loving yourself. In fact, selfishness does not come out of self-love. Selfishness comes out of a lack of a healthy self-love. If you don't love yourself in a healthy way, you're going to be a very self-centered, selfish person. You will be your own God. You'll never be satisfied. You'll never be content. And you cannot do what this, the heart of this message is all about. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. You're only gonna love you when you love God in a healthy way. And then and only then can you love your neighbor in a healthy way. Whoever that neighbor happens to be, look to your left and look to your right. If it's your family members, ha, you need to turn and say, hi neighbor, because that's who your first neighbor is, is your family. Consider as well, your next door neighbors may very well be your neighbors. Yes. Look around your neighborhood and say, who are my neighbors? And somebody asked Jesus that question and it ends up being the person who is in need is my neighbor. Who's in need? Well, as I look up and down my street, I recognize where I live that every human being I come into contact with is in need in some way. How do I fit in that and be a neighbor, a good neighbor who, who honestly, genuinely loves my neighbor? There are some people right now in our country and in your country who are hurting. They're hurting because of the pain of COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus, what I call, lovingly call the Rona. When Rona hit us, our country shut down, your country shut down, and some who maybe you know actually contracted the disease. And some are suffering physically, some are suffering financially, 
Some are suffering in their relationships. Some are suffering in ways that, that I can't identify, but they're suffering, and maybe they're suffering in grief because they have lost loved ones. You maybe have lost loved ones too, and I am so sorry if that is your situation. In fact, let me, let me just take a moment now. I want to transition to really the heart of this Bible study, and I'd like us to pray together. Lord, I've been doing a lot of talking, and I want you now to speak through your word to our hearts and bring about change in the way we are, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we behave. I pray, God, that you would bring healing to our world and peace, that the good news could be free to spread throughout the region, that, that we would be people of peace, we'd be people of good news, we'd be people who genuinely give thanks and focus on you and what you are and who you are in our lives and what you're doing in our lives so that we can not only receive from you what you're doing and what you're giving, but we can be conduits to give to others. As you bless us, help us, Lord, to be blessings to other people around us. Help us to connect in ways that are genuinely going to help other people in the way that we ourselves are helped by you. Hi, God, I love these people who are watching right now. Many of them I don't know, but you've placed the love in my heart for them as I love you. And quite a number I do know. And I thank you for them. I express to you, God, my love for them. And I pray that you will fill their lives with your richest blessings in every way, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, and most importantly, in their relationships with each other and the relationship with those in their world. God, in all of these things, I pray in the name of Jesus, my Lord, our Lord, thank you, Jesus, for making these things a reality in our lives as we depend upon you. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, 16, 17, and 18. The Apostle Paul says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. These three things go together. And I want to real briefly mention the first two and focus on the third one. The first two, rejoice always. That is, you choose joy. And you, are, you get to choose whether you're going to be happy or not. You're the only one who can. I spill something and it goes all over the kitchen floor. Or I drop a glass and it breaks. You know that the first thing is that I do when that happens? I mean, I've trained myself to do this. This is truth. It happened the other day. I dropped something, it shattered, and I mean, there was a complete mess all over my kitchen floor, and I immediately started laughing. Now, I think you're thinking, you're crazy. Why are you laughing? I'd be angry. I'd be stomping. I'd be cussing. I'd be cursing. I'd be, yeah, but I was laughing. I was laughing, first of all, at my own clumsiness. I was laughing at the mess that I had. I was laughing because, you know, I have a choice. I can either be miserable or I can be grateful. I'm grateful it didn't hit my foot. I'm grateful it just made a, a, mess, a mess there in that one spot. I'm grateful it was only the glass that broke. I'm great. I was grateful for what it was not as well as what was happening. Now, I, it says give thanks in all circumstances. Not for, but in all circumstances. So rejoice always. That's a mindset. That's your choice. Nobody else can choose that for you. You can choose joy, even, and this is, this is hard to understand, even in pain, you can choose joy. I know that's true because I've experienced it before. And if I've experienced it before, I know that you can as well. It is a choice. Now, I'm not saying it's an easy choice, but who said taking up your cross to follow Jesus was easy? Who said it was designed to be easy? It is not easy. The picking up your cross to follow Jesus. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising its 
shame, the humiliation of the cross. He despised it and at the same time was experiencing joy that had was set before him. And I believe he was looking through time to you and recognized you would be a follower of his. You would love him and you would receive new life from him. Yes, you are the reason he went to the cross and you are the reason he, in his pain, was still experiencing joy. Now, wrap your mind around that one and figure out if that's how he feels about you, that's what he's done for you, then how can you help but love him? By the way, that's, that's the heart of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't do that on your own. And the commandment doesn't start with you. It starts with God. Remember, Jesus said, here's the first and greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Why did he start with God? Because it is God who made you. It is God who loves you. And because he loves you, you love him. He, <laughs> get it right, he loves you first. First John chapter 4 still says that. We love because he first loved us. So I rejoice always. I pray without ceasing, which just simply means this. I want my every thought to include God. I want to be thinking as I think that I'm not just thinking to myself. I was driving down the road the other day and I was thinking, man, it's hot today. And then I thought, why did I say man? Why am I speaking to man, obviously just to myself, when I could be saying that to God? And so I said, Lord, I'm, it, it's hot today. Lord, I'm bored. Hmm, that rhymed. Lord, now there's a person I really care about. Lord, there's somebody I, oh, huh, I shouldn't be thinking about that, should I, Lord? See, when I'm thinking my thoughts, including the Lord in my thinking, it will help me think the right things and I can love God out of those thoughts. Are you with me? So prayer is an answer to how do you keep your mindset on the Lord all day long? Well, you pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Make every thought a dedication of a communication with God. Think to the Lord, not just think. Don't just think your thoughts, include him in your thoughts and recognize this. He knows what you're thinking anyway. Why not go ahead and think them toward him? Remember, you're thinking to him. You're saying whatever it is you're saying to yourself, you're just really saying them to the Lord. And thirdly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. Now, not just this, giving thanks, but these three things. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, give thanks. All three of those go together and those are the will of God for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're in any situation where you can rejoice, your choice. You can pray, again, your choice. And you can give thanks, <laughs> thirdly, your choice. That's the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that by first of all recognizing it is your choice. Nobody can take that away from you. You decide if you're going to be thankful or not. It's, it's more than an attitude, it's an action. It's more than an attitude and an action, it's a feeling. It's more than an attitude and an action and a feeling, it's a core of who you are. You're either a grateful, thankful person or you are a complaining, criticizing, and contempt-filled person. It starts off with complaining. I really don't like how hot it is. I don't like how humid it is. I don't how, like how my relationship is. I don't like how you're doing things. I don't like how you wash the dishes. I don't like how you wipe off the floor. I don't like how you, I don't like you. All right, I complain, I criticize. I criticize the things you do and I, I begin to criticize who you are. Not only how you cut your hair or how you comb your hair, if you have any hair or you don't, or what you think or how you act or what you say. I criticize those things, but then I start looking at you with a look of contempt. And I say, you know, I really don't care about you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a matter of not only do I not care, if I were thinking anything about you, I'm thinking bad things about you. <laughs> contempt. Yeah, that's just the way you are. 
See, I'm not criticizing what you do anymore. I'm criticizing you as a person. I'm contempt. I'm feeling contempt toward you. Listen, that's a thought process that works itself as an attitude. And John Gottman says, when you reach that point, you reach to the fourth stage and that's stonewalling where you shut them down. You don't even act toward them. You ignore them. You avoid them. You, you just have very little, only the very minimum interaction will you permit when you're stonewalling. So watch how that happens. You complain, you criticize, you're full of contempt towards someone, and you shut them off. They are a non-person. You treat them as if they, they have no value at all. How is that love? How's that loving your neighbor? I said there were three or four events in my life that changed how I am, who I am, how I approach life. The first one, major event. Well, let me go back. There was a major event when I was about 16 years old and my mom and dad divorced. He was a man who married my mother and adopted me. They divorced and my world shattered when I was 16. I didn't really communicate that very well at the time, but I did communicate it. I was hurting and I did things that I still regret to this day. I said things that I still regret to this day when I was 16 years old and here I am 62 years old. So that, that was an event that happened. I went off to college and three years later in 1978, well, two years later, 1978, November, November 22nd, 1230 in the morning, I was driving home after driving a friend to her home. I was driving home 1230 in the morning, a drunk woman driving on the wrong side of a four lane highway hit me, threw me out of, hit my car, threw me out of the car and I landed on this side of my head, nearly died. Yes, my friend, that changed my life. It made me realize how short life is. It made me realize who, what is most important. It's not a what, it's a who. Who is most important in your life? Because God didn't make you for things. He made you for relationship. And I recognized that because of this car accident. What really matters in life is, did I really live a life that matters? Did I really live a life where I love did I really live a life on purpose, with a purpose? Nah, those are so critical questions to ask about yourself. And those are questions that I began to ask when I was 20 years old in that accident. I married Jan, the love of my life, two years later. Three years later, we had our first child. A year after that, in 10 days, we had our second child. A year and a half after that, we had our third child. Then we moved a month after that to a new place where we were for four years. I'd been a campus minister, then preaching, then back to campus ministry and began preaching there. And then to campus ministry and preaching combined and mission work in Logan, Utah, and then back to teaching at a university, which I had done part-time and the whole, whole time. And, and I'm telling you all of this to say, I focused my life on understanding the will of God and learning how to communicate because communication is the heart of relationships. Relationship with God and relationship with myself. Yes, I communicate with me, don't you? You communicate with yourself. All day long, you're talking to yourself. So in the morning, when you start off talking with yourself, how do you begin this conversation? Do you say, oh, good Lord, morning? Or do you say, Good morning, Lord. See, your thoughts are directed to someone, right? And, and whenever you wake up in the morning, why waste your first words just to yourself? Why not think them to God? Good morning, Lord, instead of good Lord, morning. All right, so we start there and how we think. And, uh, and so here I, I'm looking at what, what it takes to build healthy relationships with God, internally with myself and then with other people. You do need to work on you. Self-care and self-development, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that's not what it's all about. What it is all about is who God is in your life and what God does in your life. Now, if I understand this and I, I embrace the God of heaven in my life, then I can work on me in a healthy way. 
And then I can work on my relationship with you. But I need to recognize I'm only responsible for me. I'm not responsible for anyone else. I can't change anyone else, but I can change me. Good news, right? I can change. That's really good news. You're not stuck where you are. You can change. So if you've been complaining up to this time, why not do, listen, here, here's, a, here's the process. We're going to end with this. Romans chapter 1. We were in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now we're looking at Romans chapter 1. And I want you to see the process of God turning people over to their own lifestyle, to their own desires, to their own destruction. Here's what it says. The wrath of God, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. You ready? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although, now listen, this is, it. This is the heart of what I'm talking about. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They started making statues and then bowing down to those statues as if they, they were gods. And he said they exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the eternal God, creator God, loving God, father God. They exchanged God for these statues. Why? How did it start? They, first of all, refused to honor him as God and give him thanks. The opposite of complaining, the opposite of criticism, the opposite of contempt is gratitude. Gratitude. What I want you to do now is take out a sheet of paper and I want you to begin a process for the next 30 days. This is what I want you, two things. I want you to write down everything you have in your life to be thankful for. Everything valuable to you that you can be thankful for. Let me show you what I mean. I have hair and I'm thankful I have hair. I have two ears, they both work. Now I do wear hearing aids, but I... I'm thankful that I can hear. I have two eyes. Now, they're weak, and I had a surgery on one of my eyes, but you can see, I can still see okay, and I'm thankful for that. I smell. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I said that right. I smell. That is, I have the ability to smell things. <laughs> I have the ability to smell things, and I'm thankful that I do because I also have the ability to taste food and to taste things that aren't good for me, and I say, oh, I don't want that, Right? I have a healthy heart. I'm thankful for that. I have two lungs that work. I've got a stomach that digests the food well. I can eliminate my food well. I mean, I've got muscles that work and feet that hold me up and legs that can balance and walk and run. I've got, I've got people in my, life, in my life who love me. I had 36 wonderful years of marriage. Now, they weren't all good. I've got to be honest with you. You know, as somebody in your life dies, we tend to make more of a saint out of them than what they really are. I think that's what's happening right now in our country in the murder of a particular man. I think that he's become a martyr and a saint when really he was not that good of a man any more than I am that good of a man, any more than anyone is. You see, there are some good things about me and some bad things about me. And there are good things about George and there were bad things about George. The thing is, he was unjustly murdered and is causing a lot of internal reflection in our country and around the world. All right, putting that aside, I want to come back to this. That is, I can be thankful for a lot of things and people in my life. I am very thankful for 36 years, wonderful, 
years overall with my wife. I am not thankful that she died. I'm not thankful that she had cancer. I am thankful that she died in the Lord. I am thankful that we had 36 years and they were great years. In fact, our worst time is better than having no... Our worst time was better than having no time at all. And, and the things that I complained about and that I criticized, and occasionally, yes, I felt contempt. By the way, every human being goes through that, has those experiences. The only one I know who never did that was Jesus himself. And he kept his mind, his heart, his soul, his strength, focused on loving God every second of his life. I believe that firmly. You're looking at a man who did not do that. And, and I have things that I regret. But we had 36 years, wonderful marriage, and 40 years of a great relationship because I knew her four years before we married. And we celebrated our 36th year holding our 36th anniversary. We held our first grandchild. You know, that, that changes everything, doesn't it? One thing having three children, another thing having three grandchildren, and now one more on the way. I have a lot to be thankful for. So make your list. This is what I come back to that. Make your list of everything you're thankful for and every one you're thankful for. And then I want you to make a list of all the ones in your life you love. Now, be careful with that list because God called you even to love your enemies. So there needs to be on that list a few enemies that you need to choose to love. Anyone you choose to say that, excuse me, that person has no value and I have no commitment to him or her, that is a person you do not love. Love is when you have value towards someone and you're committed to that person's best. That's love. That's true agape love. Value and commitment to its fullest. I know that because I learned it from Jesus and his cross. He said how valuable you are and how committed to you he is. So make your list of the ones you love. Are you ready for that? Now that's, that's the first thing. The dual list, the things you're thankful for and the ones, the people in your life you love, you've chosen to love and make them supreme in your life. All right. The second thing I want you to do is to go the next 30 days. No complaining. Catch yourself if you start to complain. Decide today, all day long, the rest of this day, I am going to say things that I'm thankful for. I'm going to say things that I'm uh, grateful to God for, or, and I'm also going to thank people for what they have done in my life, who they are in my life, I'm going to thank people and I'm going to be grateful for them even if I don't verbalize it. And then I'm going to compliment them. Hey, I really appreciate you because you did this. You know, you're really looking good today. I love the way you smile. I love the way you laugh. I love when you walk into the room, it brightens my room. It brightens my life. I mean, your smile makes this room bright and it makes my heart warm. Why not tell people that? And start looking for reasons to compliment. Compliment, especially, listen to me, parents, compliment your children. Fathers, 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 grandfathers, it is so important for you men to follow the example of God, the Father in heaven who said at Jesus' baptism, you are my son. I am very pleased with you. Here's how you say it to your son, to your daughter. You are my son. You are my daughter. I am so proud of you. I'm so proud to be your father. I don't, don't be left out, mothers. You need to do this too. Catch your children doing something right and compliment them on them. Tell them how proud you are of them. Tell them how full of joy 
you are because of them in your life and how every time you think about them, your heart just feels like it's going to explode with love. And you, and I want you to say it with your eyes when you look at your husband or your wife or the people in your life that you love. I want you to communicate with your eyes and I want you to think with your eyes. I want you to think, I love you. See, you communicate, first of all, with your eyes and with your words and with your actions. Eyes say so much. So communicate with your eyes how valuable the person is, how much you appreciate, how much you love the person, how happy you are to be in that person's life. Do you get what I'm saying? Compliment. Be thankful for. So 30 days, no complaining, but instead, don't just not complain, be thankful. Express your thanksgiving. And the way you're gonna do that is by changing the way you think about them. You are the only one responsible for how you think, how you behave, how you feel. Nobody else is responsible for that. And you're the only one that can change you. You can't change other people, stop trying. You can't change your husband, you can't change your wife, and you cannot change your children. You can influence, you can be a catalyst, but you can only change you. Good news, you can change you. So, change these two things and see what happens in the next 30 days. Fill your days with thanksgiving and gratitude from your list that you made of the things you're thankful for and the people you love, I want you to now say those things to those people, but start saying those things to God. Pray with me one more time and we're done. Lord, this has been a more lengthy Bible study than what it started off to be. In my mind, I, I just thought it was gonna be a short time together, but here we are. And, and as I, I've been encouraged. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to me through the things that we talked about today, through your word. And thank you for all the ones who have tuned in. And I pray that you will help them feel hope, that life can get better, but it happens from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's not really the things in our lives that bring us joy. It's you in our life that creates joy that when then we choose to express to others in ways of gratitude and compliments and honor and value and commitment. God, help us to live out what it is you've made us to be. And we pray these things to the honor and glory of and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this Bible study.